Um, well, folks, thank you for, for coming uh, this afternoon. And uh, it's nice to see post-term so many folks still around. Uh, our term actually ends officially at the beginning of April. But uh, uh, we're very delighted to, to have the uh, renowned critic, author, and uh, musical thinker uh, of all sorts, Alex Ross, here with us today. Um, my name is Derek Bermel. I'm the artist. I always forget to say that. I'm the artist in residence at the Institute for Advanced Study. And, um, and, and we do, in addition to the concert series, which happens here, as you know, we do these um, talks with writers and other artists. And the uh, last one we had was Shimon Addy presenting his multimedia works. Many of you saw that. Um, and today we're just going to talk a little bit about, um, about writing and, and, and um, many of you kn will obviously know um, Alex's work. I have here uh, his two books with a post-it note on the back. I don't know why, but I'll put it there in case I want to, I need it for anything. You never know when you want to post something, right? Um, these two books are The Rest is Noise. Um, uh, I, celebrated tome, um, which has been, continues to receive acclaim across the world. Um, a kind of a history of Western music and other things, um, and, and a lot more. There's, I mean, there's a lot in it, and I really recommend reading it, because I've read it twice now, and I've got so many dog-eared pages here uh, that uh, I don't know which one I'm going to choose, but I would like to share a couple of passages with you. Um, and uh, the other one is called Listen to This, which is, um, I, I believe, collected essays from The New Yorker, where, where Alex writes, and, um, uh, or I should say, in which Alex writes. He's not really aware. Uh, but um, I, there is a where, right? Yeah. Somewhere. But it's out there, also on the internet and everywhere else. And... Um, and so it's it it you know it's it's collected essays and it's it's you know a little bit of this a little bit of that but uh, but but some wonderful essays essay about Mozart essay about Schubert but also essay about Bjork Radiohead um, and uh, and touching on so many different areas of music um, and and I suppose you know uh, well uh, ha having written about so many different, having woven so many different types of, of music into, into his writing and uh, having written a lot about um, different, uh, not only different aspects of music, but, but the political landscape surrounding uh, so many different types of music. Um, I wanted to just start off by, well, the, I want to start off by asking Alex, there's a lot of questions I have, but I want to ask him about the aspect of writing, both as a journalist, as as a as a kind of serious historian, uh, and as a blogger, uh, these three different ways of of expressing musical history and, and musical writing. So I wanted to touch on that. And with that, I'm going to. Uh, I know that's a little bit of a disorganized introduction. Uh, but I can say all the awards he's won, like a MacArthur, and he's been a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize, and all kinds of wonderful things. But um, but but why don't we just start start off and start gabbing? Sure. Yeah. Well, in terms of the, these different identities that I seem to have as a uh, journalist, uh, author, and uh, blogger, whatever you want to call it, um, it's it's funny because I suppose uh, journalist is the, the main description. My my principal um, job title and, and uh, principal uh, source of my salary. Um, but I didn't really grow up thinking a lot about journalism or, or reading journalism particularly widely. I, I think what I read when I was a kid, what I absolutely devoured was, was history. Uh, not only the history of music, but uh, the, the history of you know, Europe and, and America, um, political history, uh, cultural history. Um, um, Carl Shorsky's book um, had, had a great influence, me, influence on me at a certain point, uh, just thinking of him because uh, um, uh, he's in this vicinity. And uh, this, this was the, the writing that I tried to emulate, I suppose, in unnecessarily long papers that I turned in 
uh, in in s school that rambled on and on with <coughs> unnecessary footnotes, and, um, and then it was uh, it was almost not until I started getting uh, assignments uh, to to write journalism <laughs> that I sort of uh, stopped and, and and really thought about uh, what that was because you know I didn't write for my my school newspaper in high school I, I didn't write for my uh, my college uh, paper or really for for magazines at, at college most of the writing that I did at, uh, in college was quite impenetrable and, and now totally incomprehensible to me it was sort of the the heyday of post-structuralism so all of my papers were about the impossibility of writing about the particular texts that, that, that I was uh, so but you were at assigned. Harvard yeah and were you guys into deconstruction? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Well, some of I us were. I thought that was it's us. <laughs> on the other there was, side of there was there was certainly a strong a strong minority of uh, okay. people. And maybe not so much the uh, the um, the professors uh, themselves, but but quite a few of the graduate students, uh, and then it just sort of spread uh, to the undergraduates as, as well. So uh, so I no longer have any idea of what I was talking about in, in, in some of these papers. But what's happened to deconstructionism? Well, I, I think it's still sort of you know bubbling, <laughs> bubbling along, and <laughs> in various places. I, I haven't been keeping uh, close track of it. I have all these these books by Derrida and you know Deleuze and Guattari on, on my shelves, but uh, but uh, I, I do find it <coughs> somehow that maybe just a deterioration as as I'm getting older, I, I, I find it um, harder to get into. But the deconstructionists were very cruel to me. I mean, they weren't nice to me personally. <laughs> Uh, at Yale, but when one of them found out that my dad had written a book about Artaud, and then was nice to me for some reason. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, okay. that certainly yeah, makes sense. Yeah, um, Adorno. I read a lot of Adorno in in, in yes. college, and it comes uh, into the the books. Yeah, yeah, I mean, certainly. He's, he's a, a lot major about figure in, in 20th century music. Uh, um, I remember once I was looking at the the index of Adorno's aesthetic theory, and uh, I saw the words cipher circus city planning uh, in sequence there, and I decided as an intellectual exercise to, to write a paper, uh, it was on the topic of Malevich, actually, for one of my um, art classes, uh, that would have the title, <laughs> Cypher Circus City Planning, the something or other of the phenomenology, you know, some, you know, I forget how it went from there. Um, and, uh, and uh, yeah, it, you know, Got a B plus or something, <laughs> more or less pulled it off, <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So there was a lot of that in the air, and um, but but where I sort of started to make this detour into journalism was actually uh, at my college radio station. The Harvard radio station had a, a very strong and still has a very strong classical music department, uh, eight or more hours of of classical music a day, which is which is pretty extraordinary for a college station. And I really spent a great deal of, of time uh, my last uh, three years of college uh, there as opposed to really, um, you know, actually um, in, in, in class and, and uh, working on papers. I mean, the, the, the radio station uh, didn't really took over my life. And this is where I, I learned so much about uh, the history of the, the 20th century, especially. There was a great record collection, and just every week I was discovering uh, a new composer, you know, Ligeti, Penderecki, Morton Feldman, Cage, you know, Boulez, Ligeti, uh, one after another. And, and I had my radio show where I would play this music, and I, and I started talking about the, uh, the music on the shows, and I would ramble on and on, and <laughs> the three people who were listening uh, must have been, <laughs> I don't know what they were thinking, they were, you know, <laughs> But you had your enemies, you had your enemies at the radio station, too. Did I? Were, weren't they the, the punk guys? Well, yeah, well, there was a, a kind of a suspicious? rivalry, um, ostensibly, um, although we all basically got along. There would just be these fights from time to time over, you know, who would get which hour of the programming day, but... Um, but yeah, it's it, the there would be a switch over at 10 p.m. from the from the classical music to uh, to the punk rock show, and and the the punk rock people always like to play something particularly crude and offensive, or just right sort up. of l sort of loud and and, and, and kind of abrasive uh, at at that moment, you know. It's like a palate clean <laughs> cleanser. Right? Yeah, yeah. So it'd be you know Von Williams' Lark ascending, and then there'd be you know. <laughs> Juan Williams, there he is. 
I wonder if Vaughn uh, Williams is going to pop up a lot today. <clears throat> So then I started trying to one-up them by playing, um, you know, Zanakis uh, right before 10 p.m. And they would sort of outmaneuver me, but then they'd put on, you know, Frank Sinatra, you know, and, <laughs> and just sort of turned to this game. But I just, I started talking to these guys and, and was first impressed by them. I mean, they were just, you know, incredibly uh, brilliant people, frankly, a little smarter than, than a lot of the people who are in the classical music department. Um, and, and, they, and they knew their beloved, you know, punk rock uh, so well. And at first the music seemed like nonsense to me. Uh, but then, you know, I started kind of checking it out and particularly the, the artier, you know, bands, uh, Per Ubu and, and Sonic Youth, I started realizing that, that you know, th there could be you know, really serious artistic aspirations within quote unquote popular music. And a lot of this music wasn't popular at all. You know, actually they had this very draconian rule that if a, if a band had sold more than you know, 500 copies of a particular r record, they were thrown off the playlist uh, because they'd sold out, you know, they'd gone mainstream. So it, just, you know, it, it was a very kind of Theodore Adorno uh, ideology in, in a sense. That Not only uh, them, but also as you described, Schoenberg and uh, there were many composers along the way who kind of wore their a lack of public support, yeah. uh, you know, like a, uh, uh, like, where's my metaphor? Like a badge uh, of honor. Yes. A badge of honor. Yes. Sure. Although, you know, uh, they probably would not have refused popularity if, if it had actually come their way. And there's that wonderful story about, you know, Schoenberg was uh, driving along the Pacific Coast Highway with one of his sons and stopped at the hot dog stand. And the man was listening to uh, the radio, and Verklerte Nacht was was on at that moment. And, and uh, I think this is Ronald Schoenberg told me the story that he was just absolutely—he he never saw his father happier uh, than this moment where he just, you know, heard his music playing at hot dog stand. You know, and, and uh <laughs> there, there he fused with Kurt Weill and somehow. Um, moment. But um, but yeah, I mean, this—it was a very important kind of intellectual moment for me when I realized that. Uh, well, just up until this moment in my life, I had been listening exclusively to classical music. I was just one of those classical music geeks, and uh, and, and I began widening my horizons a bit. Uh, but yeah, I also started ex exploring quote-unquote journalism, uh, uh, sort of talking on my show and writing little CD reviews, which we printed in the program guide. And after college, that sort of turned into a, a little bit of other work I, I sent some of my reviews to a couple of magazines, uh, sort of smaller classical music magazines who gave me a, a few assignments. I started reviewing CDs at Fanfare uh, magazine. I did hundreds of reviews uh, for them of, of all kinds of obscure things. Uh, the first review I wrote was uh, of a symphony by the Swiss composer Peter Meeg whose name hasn't come up a whole lot since uh, for me, but it was, uh, it was a pretty good, pretty good piece, actually. Um, it's a lot of chaff. <laughs> <and laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but there's also there's a lot of wonderful, uh, sort of uh, obscure, but you know, composers who wrote actually you know, two or three pieces that, that, are, that are really worth hearing. And maybe well, we write two or three pieces <laughs> worth hearing, that's... Well, yeah, I mean, it's way, that's yeah. not so bad. And I and I, I would you know rather hear those two or three pieces by by all of the the lesser known composers, uh, on, you know, on a, on a regular basis as opposed to, you know, the 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 not so great pieces by you know the the canonical uh, composers who who fill up our, our programs all the time, you know, because they had their <laughs> their, their moment, low moments yeah. as well, yeah. But we you know we we hear. You know, every single piece of theirs uh, over and over again. So, um, but anyway, yeah. So this this it was really not a, a grand plan that I had to to become a music critic or to go into journalism. I, I was sort of slightly insulted <laughs> actually uh, when 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 a couple of people started making the suggestion that that I pursue music criticism because uh, I. Yeah, you know, I was prepared to go to graduate school and, and pursue an academic career, and, th and this seemed like a rather you know vulgar way to to make a living. Um, but I just loved music, and I loved actually it was really the idea of the free CDs, you know, that I was getting in the mail. That was that was a major factor because Fanfare was paying me I think um, two dollars uh, for each review, so it, it was not about <laughs> it wasn't about the, the paycheck. It was a Dickensian uh, kind of contract, yeah, there but it was absolutely about the, just the the CDs piling up and. Um, and the eventually the opportunity to go to live concerts and, and to write about them. So um, after a year of this freelance work, the New York Times offered me their lowliest fifth string position 
Uh, and I, with great trepidation, I, I moved to New York um, because I hadn't lived in, in the city before, uh, and it really uh, scared me out of my wits. Uh, and, I, and I was not making uh, a lot of money at all. I think I was basically, I'd been working in a video store uh, in Washington, D.C. right before that, and I was making more at the video store than, than, I, <laughs> than I did my first year in New York writing for the New York Times. But, uh, and then the but gray lady was not... Uh, yeah. But it was, of course, it was an incredible opportunity, and 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 so I was, you know, off and running uh, with that, and and I had to figure out how to do it. You know, how how, how do you write, you know, three hundred words about the the mass and B minor? <laughs> you know, what can you say? And and I really learned the value of economy, which was not something that that, that you know had been a high priority in college, <laughs> in in my writing, and, and of, of packing uh, the most into a few words. And then I started looking at, at the great. Uh, examples of, of writers who have done so much with a few words. I mean, Virgil Thompson uh, in the field of, of music criticism. But to look at, at every... Even when he didn't go to the concert, he still wrote oh yeah, interesting yeah, sure. reviews. <laughs> but, you know, every possible source of, of uh, inspiration, you know, uh, literature, uh, poetry, uh, you know, just the, the art of, of finding exactly... Uh, the adjective uh, that will not be trite, that will just have a, a, a little more zing to it, a, a little more uh, information, or, or that will just sort of give that, that extra uh, hint of, of evocation in, in, a, in a very short review. And even though I write much longer pieces now for The New Yorker, I try to hold on to, to all those lessons that Do I learned. Do you read composer writers like Debussy or, uh, or uh, Monsieur Croche or, of course. or Berlioz? Yeah, Berlioz. Like that I mean, yeah, at, a, at a pretty early age, I was, I was reading Berlioz's writing and, and uh, Debussy a little later. Just, you know, as a kid, I just I loved reading biographies of composers, the, the letters of composers, uh, you know, the, the, you know, I guess, a, a, you know, Cage's silence. I mean, the, the, there's, there's actually a, 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 a wonderful small library of extraordinary writing by composers uh, about music, which is just, you know, never mind what they're saying about the music, just, you know, stylistically. Uh, Berlioz's writing is amazing. Uh, Debussy's has, has this wonderful, uh, I think, mixture of, 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 a, of a sort of a w uh, wistful uh, poetry and and bite, uh, sort of sardonic bite. Uh, it's, a, it's a very particular combination, and uh, and, and Cage and and Feldman in, in the in the twentieth century, uh, um, you know, uh, Stravinsky's uh, books of of conversations. Of course, I read. I mean, you know, these. I, I think creative people have voices, which is you know manifest in in their in their medium principally, of course, but it, it also uh, comes out in every other way that they, they express themselves. So I really value composers writing for that reason. Yeah, and John Zorn now has this journal that he's been bringing out uh, called Arcana. Uh, I mean, I did a piece for them, but he has all kinds of people. I mean, in that issue that I did, I think Sean Lennon wrote something, and, and you know, there were some, you know, pretty out jazz people writing and, and some... Um, so there were there were all kinds of voices in that, and he's he's definitely trying to, you know, create a journal where 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 that that continues. But of course, online it continues as well. And so you've you've been somebody who has really actively promoted people writing blogs. Um, when I first started writing a blog, I sent it to Alex. I said, Alex, is this okay? You know, just just to see because he, uh, you know, he was known for for really being interested in this form, in this new form, uh, and many many composers blog, although some blog sporadically, I've kind of fallen off recently, but hope to get back on the wagon uh, at some point, or off the wagon, I'm not sure. But, uh, but in any case, so how did you start blogging? I mean, what brought that on? Yes, well, I had been reading, as I started my own blog in, what an ugly word, but... Blog, by the way, <laughs> we should say what that yeah, means. Blog, for, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I guess, you know, it was around the year 2000. I mean, web blogs had existed before then, but it was around 2000, 2001 that they, they really started taking off and becoming much more prevalent as as a means of expression. I've been reading some of these political blogs, like Josh Marshall and, and Andrew Sullivan, and... And it seemed for a couple of years there, there was very little happening in terms of, of cultural blogging. And then I feel like 2003 uh, into 2004, it really started to pick up. Uh, I was reading my colleague at The New Yorker, uh, Sa Sasha Fear Jones, before actually he was uh, writing for The New Yorker. Uh, he had a blog, and I was, I was fascinated by the 
the eccentricity of it and the and the sort of idiosyncrasy that you could achieve. I mean, Sasha would sometimes sort of post a, a photograph of a fire hydrant and then there'd be some sort of enigmatic uh, sort of a link to something or just a, sort of a few lines of, of commentary and then he wouldn't write anything for you know two weeks and then there'd be an explosion there was some kind of huge manifesto out of nowhere and then silence again and then and, and so you could just absolutely make it up uh, as you went along and uh, I you know um, for me it seemed a, a wonderful potential supplement to to the the regular writing that I was doing. I, I had no complaints. I had no sense of dissatisfaction whatsoever uh, being employed uh, at The New Yorker. But I felt that you know it might be able to uh, sort of let me express something in this very offhand way that, that I wouldn't be able to do on the page in the magazine. The New Yorker didn't really have a, a functioning website, certainly not a website with blogs at that time, so th there wasn't that outlet. Um, and I also saw this opportunity in terms of you know, the internet as, as a field for writing about music, writing about culture, because of course for years, writing in uh, magazines and newspapers had been on decline, uh, uh, music writing. Uh, you know, of course, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, there would be very regular common commentaries uh, on classical music in Time, in Newsweek, uh, in, in the, the National, magazines, um, uh, you know, er every newspaper in the country would have at least one uh, classical music critic, uh, sometimes uh, several, um, and, and there'd be multiple newspapers in each city. I mean, a lot of the story is, is not about the decline of classical music, it's, it's, it's about uh, a certain uh, decline in the media itself. But in any case, you know, by the be beginning of this new century, uh, classical music criticism certainly had, had dwindled to a great extent. But, you know, there's still all these people out there, uh, you know, really vast numbers of people who are following this music and, and want to talk about it or to listen in on a conversation sure, about Some of them it. are in Kansas or in... Yeah. Uh, you know, Turkmenistan, whatever. Absolutely, I'm not sure yeah. if they can get all our internet in Turkmenistan, but... Yeah, well, yeah, I'm sure they do, yeah. Uh, and, and so, yeah, so the, the instant, instantaneity of it and the universality of it is is tremendously popular. Uh, and also this opportunity to bring in other voices, uh, to bring in uh, commentators who are not professional writers. Of course, this has its pitfalls, and of course, there's, there's you know a, a lot of garbage, uh, an almost infinite <laughs> amount of garbage uh, on the internet. Uh, so it's a matter of sifting through and, and finding the voices that, that do matter. But this opportunity to have pianists, composers, saxophonists, uh, you know, uh, uh, singers uh, writing about their work online, sometimes regularly, sometimes much more you know, sporadically, uh, but it, it's actually this, this fantastic new perspective that we just weren't getting before. I mean, of course, you know, for centuries we've had musicians uh, and composers writing about their work, but it was always taking place within the much more you know, formal confines of a newspaper piece or a newspaper interview. And, and this was just uh, so much more intimate. So I, I started noticing all these these wonderful uh, musician blogs uh, sprouting up. And then, yeah, I just gave in and, and decided to, to start writing my own. And it snuck up on me. I actually, first I just thought I was setting up a website for my book, which I thought I was about to finish in 2004, uh, therestisnoise.com, which I didn't actually finish for another three years, in part because I was well, they know wasting all about too much time <laughs> on the blog. <laughs> it, 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 it was a little bit of a, of a you know, invitation to disastrous procrastination uh, because it, re it really is so much fun. It feels like work, but it's really not. <laughs> um, and uh, and yeah, and then and then I watched it take off, and I was I was really happy to help play a role in in promoting you know the, the blogs that, that I was reading and 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 linking to others and and watching the whole thing grow. I mean I don't know now whether everyone says the internet is sort of now the internet is over or blogs are over and now it's something else. It's all about Facebook and Twitter and the cloud and, and, and sort of all these <laughs> all these new concepts. Uh, but blog, the music blogs are still going pretty strong. And, and uh, I guess, of course, in classical music, once it becomes 
old fashioned, then it <laughs> becomes ever more popular in, <laughs> in right, that particular sure. world. <laughs> the story of <laughs> our lives. Well, uh, but I, I, wa I want to read just a couple passages from this book, just because there's some really evocative language. When I, there were a few things on rereading this book, because I read it when it first came out, but I uh, one of the you know th I guess there were just a couple of little tidbits that I loved in here. This is a description of uh, Schoenberg's six little pieces for piano, Opus 19. Uh, and he says, uh, the second piece is nine bars long and contains about 100 notes. It is built on a hypnotic iteration of the interval G and B, which chimes softly in place, giving off a clean, warm sound. Tendrils of sound trail around the dyad, touching at one point or another on the remaining 10 notes of the chromatic scale. But the main notes stay riveted in place. They are like two eyes staring ahead, never blinking. It's such a great, I mean, I love that description. And it's, it's so, I mean, I almost, I can't tell if I like listening to the piece better or that description of it better. But I there's mean, it's, <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot of stuff like that in here. It's so evocative. And in a way, it's not a substitute for the music, but it's, 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 it's almost its own thing, that description. Uh, and I've, you know, of course, I played those pieces, so that 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 means something else when you know the piece. But uh, with that repeated note, and here's another. Th this is just something I, I just noticed, and I was underlining lots of things, and then I realized I had too many dog-eared pages, so I stopped um, about a hundred pages through. But uh, but here it says, um, well, you were talking about Wagner, Strauss, Mahler um, balancing their sonorities with massive statements, and you said Debussy likewise populated his foggy harmonic terrain with quaint melodic characters. I just, I mean, just every word is there, you know, and I love Debussy, so it's hard to read a description of his music for me because it always feels inadequate, but just that little se sentence says a lot. Well, I think, you know, what I'm trying to do here sometimes is, you know, I'm not trying to describe the music blow by blow. I mean, even the you know approximately hundred notes of that piece by Schoenberg, uh, it's it's impossible to capture it in words. But I'm trying to encapsulate an impression, a sort of a feeling uh, that I'm left with uh, upon listening to the piece. I mean, a lot of the time, a description like this, when particularly if I'm writing in the New Yorker for uh, an audience that may include uh, a lot of people who are not. Uh, familiar with this music and, and may have a little bit of a, a stereotype, a sort of a, a, a bias against the idea of it. Uh, I'm really trying to provide uh, a threshold, in a sense, uh, or a clue. You know, I think there. I mean, with 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 the um, the the Schoenberg, it, the the dyad is the, the two notes. I mean, this is something you can you can fasten on to listening to for the first time is very easy to grasp uh, that, that there's the, the G and the B are repeating and repeating and repeating and, and uh, you know literally it gives you a thread uh, through the piece that you can follow um, that was which is something that people often think is not in so-called atonal or 12 tone music that there is no place and and of course it needs that anchor uh, and that's a great example of a piece. Yeah, of course. Well, I mean, <clears throat> then there's the question of, you know, is this altogether uh, an atonal piece when, when you have those two notes that, that sort of automatically carry a tonal implication with them? But th those kinds of ambiguities are, are present in, in so much of the, you know, so-called atonal music. But yeah, but there's so many other means of, of establishing a continuity, you know, aside from this, this familiar Western scheme of harmony. And, and you know, this, this duality of tonal music versus atonal music, which people come back to over and over and over again, I mean, it's so deceptive. When, when you look at the entirety of the 20th century, and so one thing I was really trying to do in this book was, was, to, was to really emphasize the, the vast uh, amount of music that just you know falls between these two poles and and you know uh, there isn't a great deal of music that, that you can describe as absolutely purely implacably atonal uh, nor is there a great deal of music in the 20th century that, that falls under the description of, of tonal you know in, in that in that classical sense but but there's a great deal of music that that uh, Formal sense, approximates, right. you know, tonality, or sort of uses uh, familiar uh, chords from uh, the from the old tonal language, uh, and there's so much music that, that that really vacillates in in a very 
um, passionate and, and creative way uh, between those poles. Uh, so the, 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 you know, I think, again, you know, writing about that particular piece of Schoenberg, you know, I'm trying to look past the word a tunnel and, and, and try to grasp, you know, a little bit of the, the, the actual musical complexity of, of what's happening. And, and, and you describe not only the musical, but also this very human uh, element of the competition between Schoenberg and Stravinsky, possibly more between their acolytes, but, uh, or, or our impressions of who they were. Um, and, and I love this, this moment when, you, when you're talking about all the exiles who, were, who came to the States, which is quite astonishing, who ended up here in the States. Uh, um, had there been a demand, the vendors who hawked maps of movie stars, homes on street corners in Beverly Hills could have also sold maps for the stars of European music. Schoenberg had a house on North Rockingham Avenue in Brentwood, down the way from Tyrone Power. Stravinsky lived on North Weatherly Drive, up the hill from the Sunset Strip. Rachmaninoff was on North Elm Drive, in the center of the movie colony. Bruno Walter was on North Bedford Drive, next door to Alma Mahler and Franz Werfel. Theodore Adorno on South Kenter Avenue in Brentwood, near the cellist Gregor Piedegorsky. Otto Klemperer, former head of the Kroll Opera on Bel Air Road. Up the street from the director's Otto Preminger. I mean, it goes on and on. And, and it's just, you know, it's, it's incredible who was there. And America, I mean, many, many histories... Uh, gloss over America or overlook. You made a, a deliberate point to talk a lot about America, about Ives, Copeland, the Minimalists, um, and uh, and and a lot of um, pop music. Also, uh, not always American pop music. I mean, actually, you talked a lot. You know, you you've written a lot about pop music coming from England or Iceland or elsewhere. But uh, uh, can you say something about that focus on America and American composers and what you felt needed to be told? Or? Yes. Well. I mean, the story begins in Europe, and and you know, European composers, you know, ultimately still dominate the narrative. But I mean, first of all, as an American writer, you know, of course, I was going to focus a little more on the American composers because who else <laughs> is going to to write about them? I mean, as a European critics, you know, have a sort of a select um, uh, group of Americans that they focus on. Um, you know, Cage, Feldman, uh, Elliot Carter, uh, a few others, uh, Ives to some extent. Uh, but you know, you'll find very few people. Um, over there writing about Aaron Copland, who, who I think was uh, an extraordinary composer. Um, but, you know, perhaps, you know, there is something in his music that, that uh, American listeners instinctively respond to that, that of course, may be lost, you know, uh, on people who grew up in, in a different tradition. Uh, so, yeah, I, I wanted to, to have my book uh, uh, give... Uh, those voices, uh, uh, the space that, that I thought they deserved. But I think beyond that, in, in a bigger sense, and in uh, and actually in in a in a somewhat less positive sense, a less sort of boosterish sense, I, I was sort of writing about the American situation, really as a as a metaphor for the the, the peculiar fate uh, of classical music of this old uh, European art form uh, sort of dropped down into the, the chaos of the modern world, uh, the, the technological world, uh, the, the, the political chaos of the 20th century, uh, the explosion of, of uh, you know, new voices and the infusion of, of other cultural uh, traditions from around the world, you know, thanks in, in great part to technology, uh, you know, all of these forces, you know, tending to, to move this old tradition to the side. So the struggle now becomes, you know, how do we, how do we sort of stay afloat? And so just the, just the idea of listing the names of all those composers and the houses where they, they lived in, in, in Hollywood you know, or the Los Angeles area, I mean, it's, it's not just about Los Angeles, it's not even really about America, it's, it's just the, the peculiar situation of being a composer, <laughs> as I'm sure you all know, uh, in the modern world where you tell someone you know, what it is you do for a living and they say, what? <laughs> People are still writing that Familiar stuff? Familiar with that, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, I thought well, they, all they, those guys were dead, and and so the, you know this is a you know, literally. I mean, it's it's a it's a conversation I've had you know over and over again when, when I tell someone you know I'm off to 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 write a write a profile of John Adams and he's a contemporary composer. And, oh, huh, you know, interesting. <laughs> and, and so the idea of of a living composer playing a band. <laughs> that's usually the first question, right? right Does he yeah. play in a band? Yeah. <laughs> um, Often they do now. The yeah, younger, well, I mean, yeah. You've been uh, uh, somebody who's been very supportive and, uh, and 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 interested in. I mean, in a, in a weird way, maybe ne without necessarily meaning to, you've become a kind of advocate for young composers, for composers uh, of all stripes. You know, be they uh, the the buddies of you, the DJs who are on right after you. Uh, you know, at the at, at the Harvard radio station, or 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 you know, the most modernist uh, elements coming out of out of. Uh, Europe. Actually, you have a great statement about music, contemporary music in German, Germany and Austria in here. Um, but anyway, I, I just wanted to say that 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 uh, maybe maybe without meaning to, you be kind of became uh, an advocate for yeah, contemporary well, music. Yeah, well, this actually started happening around the same time that I uh, launched the the blog. Uh, what I had already noticed was uh, the internet was uh, such a powerful medium for uh, for you know, uh, allowing you know young composers to uh, put their work out there, without having to go through the old filters of you know going to school, finding the right mentors, getting recommended for the right fellowships, uh, you know, having starting to get performances here and there, uh, and then you know eventually it could take a, a long time. Uh, starting to get your work published and and having uh, recordings uh, uh, be made, uh, and sort of only then were you at the point where you know a, a global audience or even a national audience could could start to hear your work, uh, and now it is potentially instantaneous, and and you can be living. Uh, in Alaska or Australia or anywhere else in, in the world, and and you know, if you get some people to play your piece, you can put it on the internet, and people can start listening to it. And again, potentially, uh, your your reputation can start to grow. Uh, of course, there are now thousands and thousands. And of it can young have composers. disadvantages <laughs> too. Yeah, because you can put yeah. a lot of stuff out there, and then people get an impression of you very early. Well, there's that, and there's also well, there's first the difficulty of getting people to listen, you know, and then yes, if if uh, you know a bunch of people can just start to identify you with that one piece. That you know you put you put on your website that people started linking to. And so you know, as with technology, as with you know any medium of of publicity, uh, there's an upside and downside. But on on my yeah my blog, I, I just started at a certain point linking to sort of mentioning the names of of young composers that I found interesting uh, because well I was actually somewhat uh, I was a little frustrated by. Uh, some of the pieces that were being presented to me, you know, on, uh, th through through the the usual sources. So I was kind of looking for for alternatives to some extent, just sort of doing my own research. Well, well, who are the kind of the the student composers uh, that I that I should be paying attention to? I wrote a, a piece for the New Yorker sort of on that topic, uh, and then it sort of grew from there on on my website. And um, I don't, you know, I try not to think of myself as an advocate in the sense of you know, these are the five young composers you've got to pay attention to, and you know, sort of, you know, the, these are the, the, you know, the, this is the the future of music. I mean, it's more like this might be worth a listen. You know, here's I I, I can I hear something here that that's uh, that sort of catches my attention. You know, let's let's see how it goes, and, you know, where it goes from there. And a little bit like being a word DJ. Word yeah, DJ, yeah. So you just right? get, I, a lot of the time, I mean, the internet is also so powerful just for for giving someone a mention, you know. And, and, and people, especially at that age, are, are are so kind of desperate for to to have that first step or sort of second step, third step in their careers. I think they they really appreciate even you know just just a few words uh, on a website. It can mean a lot to them. So I feel that's kind of my my duty now on, on my blog to to carry that on because. I think that is a, a valuable role that I can play, but no, but I'm definitely not trying to make a list of you know <coughs> the uh, the composers that that really matter because you know it, it takes it takes a long time for <laughs> for people to develop and and you know so I just sort of wait and see. And Copeland used to do that. He used to have this. <coughs> didn't he have a radio show or something where he would announce these are the people to watch, and then right some of them you know were and some weren't. 
most of them weren't. A few were. He got lucky because, you know, law of averages, I suppose. But uh, you never know. You know, as, and that's it's it's so much about people, how they're going to develop, not just as a an artist, but also as a person. I yeah, suppose. yeah. And so, I mean, I think, and there's, I, I, f I see a, a big difference between uh, that kind of mention on my website versus, you know, writing a column uh, about a, a particular uh, composer in The New Yorker. I mean, that, that is much more of a sort of emphatic statement on, on my part, and I will ponder for a long time, sort of trying to decide, well, you know, uh, you know, how much am, do I do I really feel this? You know, uh, you know, am I sort of jumping too quickly uh, into this? You know, should I wait a little longer? And, and uh, so yes, yeah, so that sort of the, you're sort of torn between the journalistic temptation to get out there and be the first to talk and talk about this new up and comer, but you know, at the same time, I just I don't want to uh, you know overpraise someone too early, so I often do hold back. Uh, and and just sort of wait uh, a little bit and then see what the what the next few pieces are like. And, and uh, you're now writing about Wagner. Or, uh, do you want to say anything about what sure, you're writing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. About Wagner. And you know, the, I, my and beyond. next book, which is going to take a, uh, a few years, hopefully not quite as long as the rest is noise, which took me almost ten years. Uh, but it will be called Wagnerism, <laughs> and uh, it will be about Wagner's cultural impact uh, on everything but music. I'm not going to talk about his, his musical influence. That's too vast a subject in itself. But I want to talk about how he, how he affected uh, novelists and poets, painters, architects, uh, filmmakers. Uh, get a, a little bit into his, his influence on philosophy and, and sort of political thinking. But, uh, but for the most part, I, I wanted to focus on the... Uh, the cultural impact, which is gigantic, you know. I mean, if you were a young artist in any you didn't field, say composers, but what? also composers. No, I'm not. Oh, I'm not on. I don't want to write about his influence on, on composers because, yeah, it's just. Well, you did that's a lot a book of book in itself. Yeah, I mean, and there's a lot book, in there. There's a lot of it. Yeah, Wagner's impact. It was enormous. I mean, you have to almost start with that because you start yeah. talking about Strauss and Mahler, and then you have to go back to Wagner. Or, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Uh, you know, really, it, in a way, I mean, you could write a book about modernism, which would go from. Uh, 1850 to 1950. I mean, in in a sense, that is sort of the great arc of of uh, modern modernism as as a movement in music. Uh, I think it, uh, this this arbitrary n uh, notion of beginning with uh, in, in 1900 is you know it, you you have to go back, <laughs> uh, to to really tell the story. And there are so many unanticipated things that happen along the way, as you point out in these books, jazz. When Dvorak wrote about American music, uh, what needed to happen to create an American music that was true and coming from the earth, and et cetera. Uh, and then jazz came. And how do you explain that? That wasn't a concert music. That was a music that it came from elsewhere. And then all of a sudden, you kind of have to reassess what he, w what he meant and the, the impact of that. Um, so, uh, But all these things are, are in this book. And also, you deal with the, I mean, I, I, I think a question that's still, I mean, I mean, there are a lot of topics that you address in this book that aren't addressed. Uh, uh, you know, African American music is you really kind of dig in there and you and uh, and tie it into uh, other uh, uh, other musics and as well, obviously. In yeah, too. I mean that was a, that was a really important question that that sort of loomed over me when I stepped way back and, and looked at American music and 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 the history of American classical music. And then to where it fits in, in, in the larger firmament of American music in all genres. Um, and what immediately jumps out at me is, you know, there are so many uh, incredibly important and powerful uh, African-American uh, voices. Uh, of course, you know, going back to the, the early days of jazz and, and many fewer such voices within um, classical composition. Of course, there's some William Grant Still and and, and uh, so many other uh, interesting uh, African American composers, but not in in that sense that Dvorak had prophesied, uh, where he was essentially looking ahead to this this great age of um, uh, music influenced by the Negro spirituals, as as he put it, uh, written by by white composers and, and black composers. Uh, he thought it would be sort of a, a universal source of in inspiration, but he was particularly 
attentive um, in, in, a, in a quite visionary way, maybe even in a somewhat uh, uh, courageous way, uh, to uh, young uh, African-American musicians and, and composers and, and helping to cultivate them. Um, and you know, so many of them did experience great frustration uh, as they tried to make a career. And, and quite a few of them ended up going into careers in jazz and some other areas of pop music because they, they simply couldn't get a job in, in classical music where, of course, there was a, a tremendous amount of racism uh, in the early 20th century. And it's really a rather sad story. I mean, that chapter of my book I consider to be um, a, a very tragic tale of, of America falling short of its ideals. Yeah, and, and I mean, you touch on... The, the fact that so many of our great composers in America were gay, that there's so many, that there's a dearth of women composers, that th there's always been, maybe that's changing now, just in this very latest generation. Uh, but still, when I do talks at school, I mean, I still see it's nine to one. I mean, it's still in composition. It's, uh, I don't this know why really, that is. Yeah, this is finally changing. I mean, it's in, in the past 10 or 20 years, uh, you know, we've finally started to see um, that kind of, Diversity, uh, which I th which I think is so important, you know, in terms of how the the art form is presenting its face to the world. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I want to uh, open this up for for some questions. If anybody has questions for Alex about anything at all. Oh, you know what? We'll, uh, I will uh, give you uh, the microphone. I don't know if you have another one here, but. I um, I was curious that uh, it seems like so much of the music you hear today is in the context of a film score or, or um, uh, and does that mean much of the creative uh, intensity of today's generation is in that direction or is it still like a notch below if it's you know if it's just concert music that's the best and you just second rate. Uh, after that, or what is your own view on that question? Well, it's the, you know the story of, of film music is a really interesting one. I, I wrote a certain amount, a little bit about it in, in the rest is noise. There's a great deal more that could be said. Uh, and then a year or two ago, I, I spent a lot of time out in Los Angeles uh, watching a film composer at work uh, because I've always been fascinated by the process, uh, and it's and it's such a different process from from what. Uh, um, concert music uh, composers are are accustomed to. Even if you have a, a deadline uh, pressing down on you, uh, the 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 pace of work is is just nothing like what what uh, what film composers experience. And, and Michael Giacchino was uh, th the one that I observed, and he was writing music for the TV show Lost at the time, and he would get the edit of the show, and he would basically have he used to have two days, and I think for the final season of the show, they they were in a luxurious mood, and they gave him two and a half days uh, to write the music, and it amounts to you know uh, around half an hour or more uh, of music for each show. And he's repeating a lot of motifs that is that has been using throughout the the series, uh, or repeating motifs you know within the show from scene to scene. But he's still composing and and basically um, orchestrating uh, as he went along as well. He there would be an, uh, a copyist and, and uh, uh, who would sort of you know put the whole thing into a uh, uh, full score uh, eventually but but he was making uh, sort of the, the choices in terms of instrumentation as he went along and and it's it's amazing you know <laughs> uh, he had he had so little time to uh, he had really no time to sort of get in some kind of <laughs> creative you know uh, slump or, or sort of uh, you know ponder what was going to happen next. He just had to make these sort of instant decisions, um, and uh, and that uh, fascinated me as just a, as a very different way of of going about writing music. But you know, of course, I mean, I think people who work in in film are are still looked down upon uh, by by a lot of people. I mean, maybe from uh, you know composers on the other side of the fence. Uh, in, in the concert world, and, and also audiences. I think you know a lot of you know, many members of classical music audiences will will <coughs> uh, look rather askance uh, 
um, at at film music, and uh, you know, unless it's sort of a, you know an old classic by Korngold or Bernard Herrmann uh, popping up on a on a program occasionally, you know, there'll there'll be uh, that that resistance to it. Um, but um, you know, and then there's a the question: if you if you sort of plop a whole film score down on a on a symphony program, it it it, it it's not going to hold up <laughs> usually uh, the way a Beethoven symphony will. But but that doesn't mean that that this isn't a uh, you know a, a very important uh, musical tradition with a great deal of history to it, uh, with a great deal of uh, technique built into it. That's really worth kind of studying and and thinking about and responding to critically. You know, uh, so I, I've tried to do that from time to time. In, in my writing. It seems though now, I mean, there's sort of, uh, again, sort of talking vaguely about these kind of young composers as a rule, but but uh, there, uh, some of them seem to be dabbling sort of more freely in, in you know, doing a little bit of film writing on the side without getting too caught up in the question of, am I becoming a film composer now? Or am I, you know, this, this is kind of, a, of identity. You know, they can yeah. sort of go back and forth. They can maybe write a little bit of video game music as well, which, you know, pays good money, I suppose. Uh, and then sort of go back to the, to the concert work. And, and uh, I think that would... That so many composers, I mean, you described <coughs> this, have, have, have written film music, uh, uh, I mean, Take Copeland, uh, Prokofiev, Shostakovich, uh, uh, Bernstein, you know, uh, and and we even in modern times, uh, as you describe, I mean, the la we've had several uh, uh, people have won an Oscar, Tandon, uh, Corleano, Corleano, uh, and 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 Osvaldo has just done a film, and Galihov, uh, and uh, Philip Glass, obviously, you know, made. Made his name more in many ways. I mean, in the popular world as a film composer, I mean, he's done forty films, uh, and you know he makes a million bucks. Me, as a film, you know, so it's not too bad. It's not slim pickings. <laughs> uh, but 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 what I was going to say about that is I, I do think that there there has what it has diverged is the training. There are separate films, you know, schools for writing film music, and you know, and and so there there still is a, a schism. Yeah, but there are really a lot is, of people yeah. crossing that that boundary. Um, I think it's healthy on both sides. I think it's certainly healthy for the film music world, for the film world to to, to have uh, different uh, different voices on their soundtracks. Because you know, I hear just all you know a lot of cliches. You know, a lot of sort of devices being used over and over again on 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 film scores, and to have someone come coming to it for the first time and trying uh, some different tricks is is healthy. Um, and then I think it could be it could be very healthy for uh, a young composer sort of emerging from an academic environment to to try to work at that pace. ridiculously sped up pace and, and sort of see what results you know it, may, it might turn out to be rather liberating. Well, in all these situations, I mean, when you work with a choreographer, for example, uh, you know you're getting feedback that you never got from your academic teachers. When a choreographer said, "Well, can you? I like that stuff in four. Could you do that in six? But the same music." You know what kind of what kind of question is that? I heard or a great story. A film composer told me that um, that that he got this response once from a director who said, "Could you make it twenty percent more Cuban?" Oh, that's <laughs> you get. <laughs> I mean, you get 20%. that you get that stuff a lot from from people because their vocabulary is completely different, yeah. and they're they're <laughs> responding emotionally to music, which anyone should do. But 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 quite often the uh, the comments are. You know, you're taken aback by the company. I, mean, I just finished a film, a documentary. Uh, the first film I did was not a documentary. It was like a, uh, you know, just a um, kind of a action bang bang kind of film about gangs in Queens. But the se the second one is a, is is about Brooklyn, so I've moved <laughs> up or across. <laughs> but uh, but it, but it's about it's about it's about the the Atlantic Yards in Brooklyn. So it's an interesting documentary. It's coming out actually next month. And uh, and the process of doing it, getting these comments from people that you just Aghast. <laughs> How do I deal with when somebody says, "Well, you know, it's we need something. It needs something else. Can you get me something later today? Something else?" You say, "Well, what do you mean something? Else? Just something else. It's something that has more, something. more of something. That that thing that you did before. And they, what did I do before? And you're trying to do, you know find this out before five o'clock. You need to you know have have it and present it also in some type of computerized form. So it's. It's amazing, you know, as technology speeds up that. Uh, the other great story that I heard when I was writing that piece was um, a, 
a uh, composer uh, played the piece for the director, and the director said, it's not loud enough, and he said, and it should be louder. And, and the composer said, but, but it's already marked fortissimo. You know, it, it, can't, it can't get any louder than that. And, and the director said, could it be five tissimo? Five tissimo, that's great. Five tissimo. That sounds like Spinal Tap. I mean, it's, it could have come right out of Spinal Tap. Yes, five tissimo. Yes. I think five tissimo is definitely going to yeah, well. <laughs> have to be a piece. Yeah, I that'll be my, no. yeah, my, al my own personal album. Um, influence, how I influence composers. Um, I don't think so. Uh, I'm sort of scared of the idea, <laughs> in a sense, of, of having uh, any, any sort of influence in, in a very direct sense. I mean, I, I like to think of myself as an observer recording what is happening uh, as opposed to uh, influencing events. But of course I want to have influence in the sense of alerting people to uh, music that, that I think is strong and valuable and worth listening to. And, and sometimes if I may criticize um, the activities of a certain institution in the hope that they'll do something more interesting uh, with their programming or, or whatever it is that I'm driving at my reviews. But in terms of influencing composers, no, I, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, I, I'd almost say I hope not, <laughs> because because I want, I, I you know, a, a composer worth listening to will will absolutely be expressing what it is that that he or she must say, as as opposed to writing something that. Uh, that uh, an audience might like, or, or a critic might like, or an institution might like. You know, I exactly what I'm listening for is that uh, that inevitability. You know, Bernstein used to call it that, that sense that it, it has to be this way, and and, and there's and there's no other choice. There's a fascinating um, chapter in Sibelius on 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 the composer Sibelius in in your yeah. book where you discuss this very issue. Yeah, well, you know, as many people know, Sibelius. Uh, stopped writing music almost completely uh, at the end of the 1920s, uh, and, and he and he lived uh, uh, another uh, almost uh, 30 years. Um, and part of the the problem that he seemed to have was thinking too much, worrying too much about his reputation, about the way he was perceived, and and the fact that critics such as Olin Downs uh, of the New York Times were acclaiming him as the you know the living uh, inheritor of Beethoven. Not only him, uh, but his mom. Yeah, his mother. Yeah, it's, it's one of the it's one of my favorite moments in, in the book. It's just so bizarre when when Olin Downs writes a letter to Sibelius, quoting. I think I have to uh, yeah. read it aloud for you because it's just uh, it's just sort of stupefying. Um, uh, he he uh, read uh, conveyed to Sibelius uh, a message from uh, his mother uh, who was a uh, a teetotaler and, and um, um, crusading uh, uh, feminist. Um, uh, Louise Corson Downs was her name, I believe. Um, so here we are, 172. <coughs> I can almost recite it <laughs> from memory, but uh, I don't, I don't want to get it wrong. Uh, yes. <coughs> uh, my mother and I often speak of you, and she asked me to, again, about... Um, his Eighth Symphony. This was the piece that he worked on for many years, he may have even completed, uh, and then uh, apparently burned uh, in the fireplace in his home. Uh, tell Mr. Sibelius, he's quoting his mother now, tell Mr. Sibelius that I'm not concerned or anxious so much about his Eighth Symphony, which I know he will complete in his own good time. This is what I imagine Louise Corson Downs <laughs> might have sounded like. 
which I know he will complete in his own good time, as about his ninth. He must crown his series of works in this form with a ninth symphony, which will represent the summit and the synthesis of his whole achievement, and leave us a work which will be worthy of one of the elected few who are the true artistic descendants and inheritors of Beethoven. <laughs> so even for a composer as, as famous as Sibelius, uh, that is, that is a, a mighty expectation to live up to. Um, so anyway, that's a long-winded answer to your question. I can't blame you um, totally for the burning. But yeah, yeah, no, but it played, it played a, a role. So I think it's tricky. I think it's tricky for creative people to to uh, pay too much attention to what is written about them. And of course, you think about the negative reviews and and, and how uh, uh, penetrating all we think about. Those they are the can only be. Ones we but you know, but but positive reviews, I think, can can throw you off as well because you start to think. Oh, I, I need to do that thing again. That's something that that people liked. How how can I, you know, uh, if you start thinking that way, uh, it can it can really lead to uh, creative stagnation, or maybe you, you're sort of haunted by a sense of, well, I'm not that good, and you can sort of fall into some kind of depression on <laughs> on that point, or, or or you think, well, everyone's expecting me to do this, so I'd better try to do something completely different, and everyone doesn't like it, and then you know, there's so so many pitfalls if 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 you if you think too much about the response. To your work, um, but uh, but you also uh, you asked about record company. Uh, you know, I actually I uh, as a journalist I can't really get too involved with uh, record companies. Uh, there were actually a couple of companies that approached me about the idea of of a disc of selections to go along with the rest is noise, and, and I had to say no because it would, I'd be sort of entering into a business relationship with a record label uh, and. I wouldn't be able to write about that label again, and, and so it's just something I, I I stay away from. But uh, uh, but yeah, it's interesting questions. Thanks. But maybe we can have time for one more, and then we got to probably call it quits. Yes. When you first start Joplin and all of this, considering the fact that we think of him as a kind of jazz idiot, but you wrote an opera, a beautiful opera. Yeah, fantastic piece. The question was where where we put Scott Joplin and, and where yeah Trima I I mentioned him uh, in the book. I, I I could have said a lot more. It's it's a very um, sad story uh, in a sense because he, uh, as far as I understand it, I'm not a Scott Joplin expert, but uh, he set great store in this opera and uh, I believe had had some uh, was was somewhat disdainful uh, of of his own you know tremendously popular. Uh, ragtime pieces and, and felt that he would really only uh, leave uh, great work to posterity if he was able to, to complete something uh, in, in, in one of the approved classical forms. Um, and, and he did. I think, you know, Tree Manisha is, is a, is a fantastic piece, but the, but the sufferings that, that he endured as, as he tried to, <laughs> to, uh, 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 finish that piece and, and get people to, uh, pay attention to it were, were pretty terrible. And, and of course the, the, the race issue absolutely, uh, played a role in that. But, uh, I, there, there are a number of these figures who, I think in a different world, in, in, a, in a much different world, uh, would have had uh, major careers uh, as, as classical composers uh, if it had really, truly been uh, open to them, you know. Um, and if, even, even between if, Ellington and Gershwin, there was that feeling, you know, that Gershwin had, had a kind of uh, industry behind him, and Ellington always felt like he just was without that and wouldn't be able to produce those kinds of works. Uh, and now maybe in Ellington's case, that worked out better in a way for him or on some level, but... Uh, yeah, or even earlier. I mean, if you just think of, you know, if, if Ellington had been free really to, to, to go to conservatory and, and sort of, you know, pursue uh, composition, what, what he might have done. Uh, I mean, it's hard to think of anything greater than, <laughs> than what he gave us in terms of his jazz pieces. But the, the point is, is that the, the possibilities uh, weren't open um, to, um, to, you know, African-American uh, composers, musicians uh, at that um, period in, in time and in, in this place, and and so there there are these sort of ghost careers where where you wonder what might have been. And I think there's still pieces uh, sort of emerging from the dusk in a sense. Uh, Nathaniel Det uh, is a composer that that I don't talk about in in the book, uh, but I, I think um, was uh, uh, a significant. Uh, uh, figure and and there may be sort of a, a lot more to be learned about his corpus of of music, which which is really very little known. 
Thank you all, and thank you, Alex. For <laughs> thank you.